Scientists have transformed plastic waste into soap. Plastic pollution is a serious problem that we will have to face sooner or later. The solution may be to transform plastic waste into useful products. It turns out that polyethylene and polypropylene, from which most plastics are made, can be transformed into soap. What do plastic and soap have in common? Not much, at least in terms of texture, appearance and, most importantly, use. However, there is a surprising connection between them at the molecular level. The chemical structure of polyethylene, one of the most widely used plastics in the world today, is strikingly similar to the structure of a fatty acid that is used to make soap. Both materials are composed of long carbon chains, but fatty acids have an extra group of atoms at the end of the chain. Scientists previously thought it was possible to convert polyethylene into fatty acids, and, after a few additional process steps, produce soap. The challenge was how to split the long polyethylene chain into many short chains, but not too short, and how to do it efficiently. And such a method was developed by scientists from Virginia Tech College of Science. The results and description of the research were published in the journal, Science. Guliang Lu, a chemistry professor at Virginia Tech College of Science, was inspired by burning wood in his fireplace. Firewood consists mainly of polymers such as cellulose. Burning wood breaks down these polymers into short chains and then into small gas molecules before being fully oxidized to carbon dioxide, Lu said. If we break down synthetic polyethylene in a similar way, but stop the process before it breaks down into small gas molecules, we should get short chains, he added. Lu and his colleagues built a small oven-like reactor in their lab where they could heat polyethylene in a process called temperature gradient thermolysis. The design of the furnace allowed it to break the polymer chains and stop the process before it went too far. After the first tests, scientists collected the combustion residue and discovered that Lu's hunch was correct. The soot-like residue consisted of short-chain polyethylene. This was the first step in developing a method for recycling plastic into soap. After adding several more steps, including saponification, the team produced the world's first plastic soap. Our research shows a new way to upcycle plastics without using novel catalysts and complicated procedures, said Zhen Zhu co-author of the publication. Although the plastic that inspired this project was polyethylene, the upcycling method can also work with another type of plastic called polypropylene. These two materials make up the majority of plastics that consumers encounter every day, from product packaging to food containers to fabrics. One of the exciting things about the new upcycling method is that it can be used on both plastics at the same time, meaning there is no need to separate them. This is a major advantage over some current recycling methods, which require careful sorting of plastics to avoid contamination. The sorting process can be quite difficult due to the similarity of both plastics to each other. Another advantage of the upcycling technique is its very simple requirements, plastic and heat. Although later steps in the process require additional ingredients to convert the resulting molecules into fatty acids and soap, the initial transformation of the plastic is a simple reaction. This affects the profitability of this method, as well as its relatively low impact on the environment. This research lays the foundations for a new way to reduce waste by using used plastics to produce other useful materials. Lou hopes that over time, 
Recycling companies around the world will start using his team's technique. Archaeologists have discovered previously unknown rooms in the Sahuri Pyramid. Researchers working on the conservation and renovation of rooms in the Pyramid of Pharaoh Sahuri discovered previously unknown chambers. A total of eight hidden rooms adjacent to the burial chamber were uncovered. According to archaeologists, they were probably used to store items intended for burial with the ruler. A team of Egyptian and German archaeologists led by Egyptologist Drive. Mohammed Ismail Khalid from the Department of Egyptology at Julius Maximilians Universität Würzburg, JMU, made an important discovery inside the Sahuri Pyramid. During conservation works, eight previously unknown rooms were found. These discoveries provide new insight into the construction of the Sahuri Pyramid. The pyramid was built about 4,400 years ago for the Egyptian pharaoh Sahura of the 5th dynasty. Sahuri was the first pharaoh buried in Abuzir, an ancient Egyptian necropolis located about 2.5 kilometers north of Saqqara. 14 pyramids were built in this complex, and the Pyramid of Sahura was probably the first to be built. Originally, the pyramid was 48 meters high and the side length was 78.5 meters. A collapsed corridor led to the entrance, and the entire pyramid is in very poor condition. This, as Egyptologists pointed out, is due to the poor quality of the construction. Additionally, it has served as a source of building material for centuries. However, inside the pyramid, valuable reliefs have been preserved that shed light on the life of the Egyptians at that time and on some aspects of the ruler's reign. Compared to the Giza pyramids, the Sahuri pyramid looks more like a giant mole's mound surrounded by ruins. Although it seems that the famous structures in Giza have been explored in every possible way. Sometimes something new is discovered there. A few years ago, a previously unknown room was also discovered above the main entrance to the Great Pyramid. The pyramid was excavated in 1836 by John Shea Pering, a British engineer known for his research on ancient Egyptian buildings. He had quite unconventional methods that no one would agree to nowadays. The point is that the British sometimes used explosives. But Pering already suspected that the collapsed corridor led to a series of rooms, although during further examination of the pyramid by Ludwig Borchardt in 1907, these assumptions were questioned. The current project to preserve and restore the interior of the Sahuri Pyramid began in 2019. Its purpose was to secure the structure of the pyramid. The efforts of the archaeological team are focused primarily on cleaning the rooms inside the pyramid and stabilizing the structure to prevent further collapse. As part of the conservation effort, the team cleared a once-blocked corridor, which gave archaeologists access to previously unknown chambers that most likely served as storage. Although the northern and southern parts of the chambers, especially the ceiling, are heavily damaged, remnants of the original walls and fragments of the floor can still be seen. Archaeologists used LIDAR imaging technology to research the interior of the pyramid. Thanks to it, a detailed construction plan was created and extensive areas adjacent to the pyramid were mapped. The first cowboys were slaves. Cowboys in North America were not like they are portrayed in Hollywood movies. New research suggests that the first cattle herders actually came from Africa and were forced to work on ranches in Mexico and the Caribbean. Before the arrival of Christopher Columbus, 
There were no cows in America. Until now, it was believed that these large mammals, Bos taurus, were first transported to the new continent in the 16th century, on Columbus's ships. Then, small amounts of them appeared on the Caribbean islands. Later, cattle were raised, bred, and then moved to other areas, such as Mexico, Panama, and Colombia. As European colonization and exploration continued, scholars have long suggested that the first cows in the Americas came from Europe. But new research from scientists at the Florida Museum of Natural History adds new details to this narrative. As the data obtained by scientists suggest, some of the cattle that appeared in America with Europeans came from Africa and were imported with slaves who knew how to take care of them. This means that the first cattle herders, or cowboys, were probably enslaved Africans. The results and description of the research were published in the journal, Scientific Reports. Despite their importance today, little is known about the first cattle to be transported across the Atlantic to North America. Therefore, scientists analyzed the DNA of the remains of 21 cows discovered in five archaeological sites in Mexico and Haiti, dating from the 16th to 18th centuries. They then compared the results with the DNA of known European and African breeds. Most of the samples showed genetic links to cows from Europe. But one specimen found at a site called Bellas Artes in Mexico probably came directly from Africa and may have reached the Americas in the early 17th century. This discovery confirms the latest trends in research on the history of slavery and the key role of African slaves in cattle breeding, said Nicholas Del Sol, co-author of the study. This sample predates the first historical records of African cattle by approximately 100 years. Scientists hypothesized that with the development of cattle breeding in the 16th century, the demand for qualified farmers who could take care of cattle increased. The indigenous people of North America had no experience with cattle or any other European domestic animals before their arrival in the New World, so they were not suitable as herders. Accordingly, historical records indicate that slave traders returned to Africa, where they kidnapped people from pastoral communities and their cattle. Almost all of Mexico's first farmers were of African descent, Del Sol said. We know that a group of West African peoples called the Fulba or Fulani formed pastoral communities in which they lived in what could be described as a symbiotic relationship with cattle. This led us to believe that there was a strong possibility that the Spanish brought cattle from the same region as the people they enslaved, he added. The question of the potential African origins of cattle has enormous historical significance and profound social and cultural implications. Especially given the central role that African workers played in establishing ranches in the Americas, the authors wrote in the publication. Perhaps without the slave labor of experienced African shepherds, the cattle breeding industry would not have been so successful. Our data, although not fully conclusive, support the hypothesis that cattle were also imported from Africa to the Americas. Highlighting the central role of African pastoralists in the emergence of a new agricultural landscape based primarily on cattle breeding, the study authors added. The Perseverance rover captured a dust vortex on Mars. NASA's Perseverance rover has detected a dust vortex on the surface of Mars. The vortex moved along the western rim of Jezero Crater, where the rover landed in February 2021. The Perseverance rover landed on Mars in the Jezero Crater in February 2021. Since then, it has been traversing the surface of Mars. 
looking for traces of past microbial life. Scientists believe that the approximately 45-kilometer-wide Jezero crater was filled with an almost 500-meter-deep lake that was connected to a nearby river between 3.5 and 3.9 billion years ago. The crater is located north of the Martian equator on the western edge of Isidus Planitia, a plain located within a giant impact basin. Scientists believe that water flowing into the lake could have picked up possible organic molecules and other potential signs of life along the way and stored in the sediment. On August 30, 2023, during the 899th day of the Mars mission, the rover recorded a dust vortex with one of its navigation cameras. Much weaker and smaller than Earth's tornadoes, Air or dust whirls are one of the mechanisms responsible for moving and distributing dust around Mars. Scientists study them to better understand the dynamics of Mars' thin atmosphere and improve their weather models. By analyzing the transmitted images, mission scientists determined that the vortex captured by Perseverance was about 4 kilometers away from the rover at a location called Thorafair Ridge, and was moving east to west at a speed of about 19 km per hour. They also calculated that its width at the base was about 60 meters. And although the camera frame only shows the lower part of the approximately 118 meter long vortex, scientists estimated its full height at about 2 km based on the shadows cast by the vortex. We can't see the top of the dust vortex, but the shadow it casts gives a good indication of its height. Most of these types of phenomena are vertical columns. If this vortex also looked like this, its shadow would indicate it was about 2 kilometers high, said NASA's Mark Lemon. Dust whirls on Mars are created by the same processes as on Earth. Sunlight heats the surface causing the air closest to it to rise. In turn, cool air flows down to fill the gap. Under the right circumstances, a vortex is created. When the surface is covered with dust or sand, it is drawn into the vortex, making it highly visible. This isn't the first time the Mars rover has noticed such a phenomenon. Despite a thin atmosphere and less solar radiation reaching the red planet, Dust whirls are quite common on Mars. Last year, Perseverance recorded three such phenomena at once. He saw them this year too. But the whirlpools are not limited to the Jezero crater area. Curiosity also spotted it, and it is located in the Gale crater, south of the equator.